Well, good morning, brothers and sisters. It's good to see uh, you all to gather again uh, today after such a wonderful night. Go ahead and stand with us. And we'll begin, uh, we'll begin our morning prayer singing praise to God. And please do that. Sing out. I know it's early, but give it your all. Give it your, your best. Christ. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought. Open my lips, and my mouth shall show forth your praise. Our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. For you made us to praise you in all things, at all times, in all places, always, everywhere, together. And so this morning, Father, draw our restless hearts to yourself. By your spirit, help us to worship you, to proclaim you, to bless you, to give you thanks for everything that is our creator, sustainer, protector, provider, our Lord and Father, our King and God, the fountain of everlasting life, the treasury of eternal goodness. Draw our restless hearts to you, that we may bring you our adoration, that we may bring you our very selves. So meet with us now. 
encourage our hearts, strengthen our faith, our faith, and fill our gaze with the beauty of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we ask it in his precious name. Amen. Amen. Let's pray with one another now in the words of Psalm 51. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Cast me not away from your presence. And take not your Holy Spirit from me. Oh, give me the comfort of your help again. And sustain me with your Holy Spirit. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen. Brothers and sisters, please take a seat as we come now to the reading and preaching of God's Word. And our reading this morning is from Isaiah 42, uh, reading verses 1 through 4. Isaiah 42, starting at verse 1. Here is my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen one, in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him, and he will bring justice to the nations. He will not shout or cry out or raise his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. In faithfulness he will bring forth justice. He will not falter or be discouraged till he establishes justice on earth. In his teaching the islands will put their hope. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning. As someone who's relatively new to the DRM, I'm so encouraged by all that the Lord is doing in our diocese. I serve at All Saints Honolulu with uh, Mark Bryans and Dawson Vorderbergi and for a couple of more weeks, uh, Jonathan and Jessica Fant, who led us in music, they're uh, le- launching out to ch- church plants on the Big Island. So uh, be praying for them and uh, give money to them, support their church plant. So we need prayer and money. Uh, so please <laughs> give us both. Um, <laughs> We pray that the Big Island Anglican Mission will be one of many, many churches that the Lord uh, uses all saints to plant. We're training pastors and church planters. I'm involved in a a little seminary that our church uh, has helped to start called Oahu Theological Seminary. In our mission in our seminary, is rooted in the text that we heard this morning. The the mission of our little seminary, and really the mission that we all share, is to proclaim the hope of Christ to the nations. And yes, to the islands. Jesus is the hope of the islands in the Pacific Rim, And all throughout the world. If you know the history of Christian missions in the Pacific, you may know that in the 19th century there were waves of missionaries who came across the Pacific. The first missionaries arrived in uh, Tahiti in 1800. In 1820, the first missionaries came to the Hawaiian Islands. In 1830, they arrived in Samoa and Fiji. And then in 1839, Two men named John Williams and James Harris landed in the New Hebrides Islands. Modern, uh, we refer to it as Vanuatu. Within minutes of arriving on shore, they were killed. But that did not stop a Scotsman named John Payton, you may have heard of him, from going to the New Hebrides Islands with the gospel. Uh, He was told before he left, famously, you will be eaten by cannibals. And he replied something like, "Um, whether I'm eaten by cannibals or eaten by worms in the grave, 
matters little to me. My call is to go proclaim Christ. I, if you don't know the story of John Payton, I won't, I won't take the time to tell the whole thing here. You should read uh, his autobiography. But through many twists and turns, including the death of his wife and a son, the gospel took root in those islands. By 1899, the New Testament was translated. 25 of the 30 islands in that chain had a gospel witness. And to this day, I have partners who are doing gospel ministry in Vanuatu. So the question is, what gave Peyton and so many others the certainty to continue on, even when threatened by disease and death and being eaten by cannibals? In short, what gave them the certainty and confidence to continue on is the promise that Christ is the hope of the world. Christ is the hope of the islands that we see here in Isaiah 42. You, you probably know that this chapter is the first of the great servant songs in Isaiah. God promises that he will keep his covenant promises. He'll deliver his people. He'll finally end the exile. He'll remove their sin once and for all. And so that, that good news that God is keeping his covenant promises is the substance of our mission, right? We proclaim the servant of the Lord has done it. That sin is a defeated enemy, that the kingdom of God is advancing, it's present among us now, and it's pushing out further and further to the ends of the earth. We could spend a lot of time talking about how scribes and scholars have uh, identified the suffering servant. There's, you can read books and books and books on that, but let's just cut to the chase. The servant is our Lord Jesus. He is the one who keeps God's covenant promises. The servant is our Lord Jesus, but no, notice who's speaking here. Throughout this section, God the Father is talking to and about his son, his beloved one. Does that sound familiar? God delighting in the servant, his beloved son, and then sending his spirit on the son to empower him for his mission. This points forward to Jesus' baptism. In fact, this is one of the lectionary read readings on the Sunday of Jesus' baptism in Epiphany. We see Father, Son, and Holy Spirit united in the work of redemption, revealing to the world that Jesus is the beloved Son who keeps God's covenant promises to the world. So this uh, section in Isaiah 42 plays the same role that the baptism of Jesus plays in the Gospels. It's an announcement that Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are together keeping God's saving promises. So the action of our triune God is the foundation of the mission of the servant to the nations. And notice all that the servant will not do. He will not cry aloud. A bruised reed he will not break. A faintly burning wick he will not quench. He will not grow faint or discouraged in the midst of all of that. This is not a, a bombastic, self-promoting, triumphalistic ministry. The Lord Jesus shows us another way. A way that's different from American politicians and kings of the world and to be frank, many pastors, he laid down his life for the sake of this mission. Jesus knew exactly where the mission was taking him, that is to the cross. The servant would suffer, as we read later in Isaiah, as you know, Isaiah 53, he lays down his life. But the suffering is actually the way he accomplishes his mission. The upside-down logic of the gospel is on display. By laying down his life, he gained it and won the victory over sin and death. So the, the mission of God's kingdom is not accomplished by the methods of the enemy. The way of the cross 
is laying down our rights, laying down our desires, laying down our very lives for the sake of others, for the sake of this mission. If you read uh, about other missionaries in the Pacific and even missionaries to Hawaii, where a bunch of us have come from this week, you may, you may read about Father Damien. Father Damien was a Roman Catholic uh, missionary who went to live among the lepers on Molokai. He went to live among them and die among them. And to this day, he's uh, counted as a hero in Hawaii, even among those who don't share our faith. There are, two, there are two statues that Hawaii sent to the U.S. Capitol. One is King Kamehameha the Great, who united the islands. And one is Father Damien, who laid down his life for the islands. And so we're called to the same. Maybe not to lay down your life for Hawaii. Maybe you are. <laughs> but the mission of the servant to lay down his life, is the mission of us, his church, right? To lay down our lives for the life of the world. As we see in our text, this mission is not just for Israel alone. It extends to the ends of the earth. So in verse 4, the NIV says, In his teaching, the islands will put their hope. The word translated islands here means something like the remotest part of the earth. So maybe in the 7th century BC for Isaiah, that's Cyprus or the Greek Isles in the Mediterranean Sea. But I think it extends beyond that. Out of the Mediterranean, across the Atlantic, across the Pacific, and beyond. The point is the mission of the servant extends to the ends of the earth. So those first missionaries who came to the Pacific Islands knew they were not on their own mission. And neither are we. The proclamation of Jesus as the hope of the islands, the hope of the furthest parts of the earth, even Denver, <laughs> where it's cold and snowy and so dry that I can't sleep. Even here, so, I'm sorry, even here, the mission of the servant continues to break in in advance. So, if you are united by faith to Jesus, the suffering servant, you are united to him in his mission, in his death, and in his resurrection. The mission of the servant continues through us, his church. And so we seek to advance God's kingdom, making disciples of all nations with the confidence that no matter what it may feel like in the moment, no matter what it may seem like as we are suffering, as we see disease and death, no matter what it feels like in that moment, God is accomplishing his purposes for the world. His kingdom will not fail. One day the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. If you really believe that, then you're free to go wherever God may call you with the confidence that the mission will be accomplished. Not because of what you do. You might last minutes on the shore like those first missionaries to Vanuatu. But whatever God calls you to do, he is calling you to a mission that will not fail. And so my prayer for us, brothers and sisters, for our diocese and for the church all over the world is that we would faithfully and boldly proclaim Jesus. Our hope and the hope of all nations to the ends of the earth even to the Pacific Islands and beyond. Our triune God will accomplish his purposes. He's calling a people from every tribe and tongue and people and nation, from Jerusalem to Denver to Hawaii 
and back again. And he sends us out with that message that Jesus is the hope of the nations so that all might see and delight in our great God and Savior, the one who suffered and rose again and calls us into that great mission, our Lord Jesus. May we be faithful stewards of this good news now and forever. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. In the ancient world, they used to think the UK was the, uh, the or Great Britain was the ends of the, the earth. Uh, I often think of Oregon as almost as far away as you could possibly get from Jerusalem when you think of the ends of the earth, but maybe Hawaii actually is, is closer to that. I'm going to pray uh, in a moment for ourselves this morning that we would be able to receive today all that the Lord has for us, that we may, as we were thinking yesterday with uh, Bishop Thad, that we may then bring that and pass that on as we seek to proclaim the Lord Jesus Christ boldly to the ends of the earth. So let's pray in response to God's word. Can I invite you to adopt a posture of humility? You can kneel or, or remain seated and bow your head as we come now to pray to the Lord. These precious words from the everlasting Father to the beloved Son. Here is my servant, the one who will bring justice to the nations. And Father, how we long for the justice of the Lord Jesus Christ to reign in every place. Gracious Father, you know of every sparrow that falls. You see every tear that we shed. And you hear the cries, not only of our hearts, but the cries of your people, too often uh, ruled by uh, leaders who are bullies and seeking dominion over their people rather than loving and gently serving them. And you hear their cries. You hear the, the groaning of a world which longs for the Lord Jesus Christ to bring the renewal of all things. My servant will not shout or cry out a bruised reed. He will not break. And Father, how we need Jesus' grace and patience as those called to proclaim life to a dying world, those called to hold out Christ to a world without hope. And yet, Father, we are those who are bruised reeds this morning. We are those who are called to bring healing and yet are wounded ourselves. And we ask that the gentle kindness of the Lord Jesus Christ would nurse our wounds and restore our souls once again. Would you, the God of all grace, bring us through suffering and trials, through hardship and pain, through heartache and turmoil, and would you restore us this morning, bruised reeds, smoldering wicks, wounded healers, would you restore us Make us strong and steadfast and overflowing, abounding with joy and hope. My servant will not falter or be discouraged. In his teaching, the islands will put their hope. No matter what our situation, Father, joy or trial, expectancy or anxiety, Lord, yes, even in life and death, the Lord Jesus is our only hope. Father, we long and desperately need the unfaltering, all-powerful, long-suffering tenacity of the Good Shepherd. We long for that and desperately need it. The one who will not let us out of his hands. Strengthen our hope in him, we pray. And Father, we ask now in the silence of our hearts to prepare us to receive his ministry to us this day. His justice, his gentleness, his restoring work in our lives. Father, in the quiet, we draw 
to mind the magnitude of the mission that you have entrusted to us to boldly proclaim Christ. And Father, we also then turn and think of ourselves, bruised reeds, wounded healers, and we ask that you would help us to receive the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ today afresh. By your spirit, do business with us, we pray, Lord Jesus. Where there is sin in our lives, rebuke us. Where there is apathy, renew us. Where there is grief, comfort us. And where there is confusion or chaos or disillusionment, shine the light of your face upon us and bring peace. In all these things and more, would your spirit bring the comforting, tender and restorative ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ to us today. And Father, now we come and we, we kneel alongside our brother and by the power of the Spirit, we join our prayers together in the words Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Amen. O oh God, the author of peace and lover of concord, to know you is eternal life, and to serve you is perfect freedom. Defend us, your humble servants, in all assaults of our enemies, that we, surely trusting in your defense, may not fear the power of any adversaries. Through the might of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Please do be seated. May the Lord God and the God of hope fill us with all joy and peace in believing through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 We go and um, into a time of worship and sing um, a song before we have our first uh, plenary session. Bishop Thad. So I'm going to invite you to stand with us again. The title of this song is called The Song of Moses. Uh, it was new. It's a new song for me. Uh, maybe not so much for you. It comes from Exodus 15 when Moses is surveying the triumph of Yahweh over the enemies. He's brought his people through the Red Sea, miraculously parted a sea, and he's closed that sea over uh, the Egyptians. And so the, the enemies of God are drowned, um, and God is victorious, and Moses sings this song. Uh, we might not feel victorious this morning. We might not see that uh, victory so clearly as Moses saw it, um, but it is true that God is a warrior. He is the God of hosts, the Lord of hosts, who goes before us and will have the victory. That hope of the nations and the islands will be realized. It's not a vain hope, it's not a small hope, it is a sure and solid and loud hope. And so as we sing the song, um, behold the God who fights for us and has the victory and will have the victory. strength and song highest praise to him belongs Christ the Lord our conquering king your name we raise your triumph sing oh praise the Lord our mighty warrior praise the Lord the glorious one by his
Heavenly Father, today we come together, gathered, gathered in your holy name. Father, be glorified in our midst. Continue to minister to us by the grace of your Holy Spirit as you've begun this day with us. And continue to, to allow your word to bring life to us. For all of us here echo the sound we are weak and we come with fear and we come with much trembling. Our speech and our message are not in plausible words of wisdom, but, but to be demonstrated by the, by the gift of the Holy Spirit in power. That our faith not rest on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. And I pray, Lord Jesus, be glorified in our midst. You somehow put treasure in earthen jars, but we just want the surpassing greatness of the power to belong to you. Be honored in our midst, most holy Lord. For it is in your name and for your glory and for the glory of our Father in heaven that we pray. Amen. We began last night, with uh, yesterday afternoon, with the text out of Colossians. Paul says the mystery hidden from past ages and generations, Colossians 1, 27 and following, to them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we proclaim warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this purpose I labor, 
striving according to his power, which mightily works within me. For this purpose, Paul said, the great commission matters. He has called us to go into mission to make disciples. The premise we began yesterday is this. We need to be disciples to make disciples. Because you can't give it unless you got it. Freely you've received, freely give. And I believe because of the nature of the church, especially in the first world today, we are set in a pattern that can't be changed unless something significant happens among us, the leaders of the church. Something has got to change. Our focus is not to be driven to the Sunday morning event. It's the celebration of what happens. Jesus said, make disciples. If you've got a problem with this, talk to him. He's here today. My thesis today is a hard one because it talks about change. Let me, let me just back up and start with a premise. When we deal with trauma care the first thing we do is to make sure that that person is safe. Safe to themselves, safe with the people they're around, and the environment around them is safe. When they are ready, the first measure of care is we put them into group. We begin to get them empowered in community because trauma disempowers and trauma separates and isolates. And so we empower and we reconnect. And so it happens in group. That is secular thought. That's what the, the, the therapists, the, the peop, the, those who are professionals in trauma care have taught us. It's done in group. You're going to be surprised to find out that the whole movement of 12 Steps with A-A-N-A-S-A all came out of Scripture. And for those who actually come to the point of knowing that they're in addiction and need help, guess what happens? They get into group. It's mentors and meetings, because what does addiction do? It isolates. Where does healing begin? You go into group. Many of us um, know over the last 20, 30 years, the work of Alpha. What happens in Alpha? There's worship, there's teaching, there's group. So this came out of, again, a pattern that our Lord Jesus actually showed us. When he discipled, guess what he did? He discipled in group. Something happens in group. The Lord has, has done this. He doesn't, he doesn't disciple one-on-one. -on -one. He got 12 and began the work and told us to make disciples. In order to do this, we need to be in group. And so I'm going to state my thesis and get off the platform, except I'm not, but I could. <laughs> this, is, this is why deep change is needed. If, I want, if my call to you is to be a disciple, in order to make disciples, to be a disciple, so that you get it, so that you can give it, and we can do the work of mission today in our world. I'm going to ask you to do something. It's going to totally wreck your schedule. I need you in group, and I need you to lead group, because miracles happen there. It's called discipling. It's called discipling. Don't tell me, don't tell me. I get it. You don't have time. I get it. Take it up with him. He told you to go make disciples. That's what he's told us to do. That's how mission begins. So I'm just going to paint the story over and over until it's ad nauseum and you want me to leave. Listen, listen just to the way, for example, go to Acts chapter 2. L look at the way it's designed. What happens? The people gather together in Acts chapter 2. They gather together. The Holy Spirit comes down upon the church and they begin to worship. Worship in other tongues, praising the Lord. Worship begins to happen. What then happens? Peter stands up and the word of God comes. Worship, gathering, the movement of the Spirit of God, the word of God comes. And immediately you find in verse 36 of chapter 2, 
When Peter ends his sermon, let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, repent and be baptized, each one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children, for all who are far off, and everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. What happened after the word of God was preached? They processed it together. They were convicted, and they needed to talk about it. They did the grist of being in fellowship. What do I do? I don't know what to do. If this is true, what happens to me? Did you hear what happened? They begin to process And the mentors, the disciples say, this is what we do. Let me teach you about repentance. Let me teach you about forgiveness. Basic baptismal instruction down into the waters. Receive the gifting of the Holy Spirit and come into the nature of the church. Oh, I wish we preached conversion more. It's miraculous. It's when the perishable seed becomes the imperishable seed and we become born again by the power of God. Moving in the soul. And you've got all the components set forward already, even now. You've got all the components, the gathering of the people, the movement of the Spirit of God, the worship, the word, and the processing. And this miraculous gift happens. And guess what happens in Acts 2.42? What do you do with a new convert? You put them into group. Look what happens in 242, 247. I'm not going to read it. You all preach this all the time. House to house, apostles teaching and fellowship, breaking of bread and prayer. Apostles teaching and fellowship, breaking bread and prayer. That is called the apostolic pattern. It's all through scripture. It's how the miracle happens. We come together in our homes. We begin to worship together. We begin to open the word together. The spirit of God begins to move among us. We begin to talk in fellowship so that we begin to get on the grist of iron, sharpening iron. That fellowship that happens. The miraculous wonder that God speaks to his people, through his people, does he not? This this wonderful thing happens and to be able to hear you say what you heard and me say what I heard and for us to work it through and then to watch the Lord working in your life as you're watching him work in my life and we're learning not only to worship the Lord and to love him with all our heart, but we're also learning to love one another. All of it happens in group. All of it happens. And this is what goes on at the very center, at the very, at the very heart of the, of the early church. This is what makes disciples, and this is what makes missionaries. Because what happens is that we grow in him. We mature in him. He meets us, and, and we begin to find ourselves a confidence of who we are in our identity, who he's called us to be, and what we're empowered to go out and be witnesses into this world. This is why it's so essential that we come to this moment and talk about what the Lord does in that group dynamic. I was, I was um, very blessed when I came uh, out of college and I was a brand new at a church and someone said to me, um, would you like to come to our home? We're having a Bible study And I said, a Bible study, I was hungry for anything. I was starving. I still am starving. And so they didn't tell me it was an (laughs) all-women's. It was just so simply done. There was worship. There was the word. There was the fellowship. We learned to pray together. The Spirit of God began to move, and I began to change. I said, can I come back? (laughs) 
these are the things that make um, the wonder and mystery happen. I can't explain it. Paul said, I plant, you water, God gives the growth. I can't explain it. All I do know is I need the seed, and I need the soil, and I need the rain, and I need the sun. Let me say it again. I need the apostles' teaching. I need the fellowship. I need the breaking of bread, and I need the prayers. That's how it happens. Now, let me just say to you, just biblically, um, the word fellowship and the word breaking of bread can be interchangeable. Um, the word fellowship often sounds like it's what happens with us. And the way 1 John 1, 3 says it, our fellowship is with one another and with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Fellowship can mean worship. Fellowship can mean what happens between us. Breaking of bread has that same context. You often say, hey, want to go break bread together? It's a sign of fellowship. But also, as we see on the, road to, on the road to Emmaus, the breaking of bread, and what we see at the communion table, the breaking of bread is part of worship. But regardless of how you interpret these things, worship, fellowship, the word, and prayer. And if you think of it, I'm really sorry to do this if you're not Anglican, it's a very Anglican service. We come together with worship. We come together into the word. We come together to pray. We come together to break bread in the fellowship. What's missing in public worship is the grist of fellowship. What happens, what happens when we're together and we talk it through? That's why I say, you think you can grow on your own. You don't know the scriptures. That's not how he does it. No seed can say, hey, I don't need the soil. I don't need the rain. I don't need the sun. I'm going to go be me. But this is not the way we're designed. It takes a humility to watch the Lord work in the context of group. And that's how in trauma care people get healed. It's how in AA, at least, at least in many ways, it allows, it allows people to recover by being together in group. Let me, let me just go to the road to Emmaus. Can you just think of the same, compo the same components are present? They're together. The, the, the apostles are together. And in being together, what happens when we gather together? Jesus comes into the midst. Do you believe that? This is, a, this is the crucial piece of everything. If the Lord's not in the house, we don't have church. We need the presence of the Lord in the midst of his people. And the Lord Jesus comes. What does the Lord Jesus do on the road to Emmaus? You remember the story? Tell me. He does. He opens the scriptures. And this is why sometimes you've got to just see behind the scenes. Because we already know from scripture that it is the Holy Spirit that gives the revelation. And what happens when he begins to open the scriptures? The scriptures start burning in their heart. And the Lord takes the word of God by the spirit of God and begins to pierce the heart. And the scriptures come alive. Did you not hear when he opened the scriptures, how our hearts burned. And there they are. It's all present. And then they begin to, and then their, their prayer, Lord, you, he was going to pass by. Lord, stay with us. Stay with us. And as they came to break bread, the miracle happened. In the breaking of the bread, the miracle happened. They beheld the glory of the Savior which was the entire premise of yesterday afternoon. The way we grow is by coming to see the glory of Jesus. It's when our eyes are upon Jesus. And what happened after he disappeared and vanished? They talked. They talked. Did you not? Did you not? Did you? But did you not? I was like, we got to go tell people. And out they went. And then the 12 got together, or the 11. 11 got together, and everybody was doing the grist of being community together. That's where the word of God, by the spirit of God, gets ingrained inside of us. We belong together. That's where the Lord speaks to us. And this is why I'm saying it's called deep change, because I'm telling you right now, that change is the pastor's schedule. i got to get it in order to give it. My focus is to make disciples. I've got to lead groups. I've got to be in group. i got to get it to give it. That changes everything. Because no one, no one in this culture, I don't think any culture, has time. And so this calls for a resetting of priority. 
And I wonder, is that possible for you? The only way it's possible is because you finally come to the moment where you realize it's essential. I'm going to paint another picture. I'm just going to keep showing you. It's, all, it's everywhere in Scripture. It's everywhere. In the moment of conflict in Acts 15, remember? The moment of conflict, they had false doctrine came in. I'm not going to go into details because I'm trusting that you know them. You are leaders of the church. I'm trusting you know the Bible. In Acts 15, there's conflict. There's, there's bad doctrine has come into the church. And so what do they do? They gather together. The apostles, the apostles and elders came together. Acts 15, verse 6. They came together. And what did they They began to speak of the things of the Lord, what he's taught them, what he showed them. They began to not only tell the testimony of the great works of the Lord that he had done, but they began to speak forth the gospel itself. The way that Peter says it so beautifully in verse 11. We believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as the Gentiles. There it is. Peter thunders his testimony. Paul and Barnabas stand up. They thunder their testimony. You have to realize that in this story, James is really part of the problem. You'll find that in Galatians 2. He was part of the false doctrine. But when they gather together, the miraculous happens. James has ears to hear, eyes to see. He's listening. In the midst of the people, he's listening because God is speaking to his people through his people. And immediately, what does James do? I love this. What does James do? He goes to the scriptures. He opens the scriptures. You'll find this in verse chapter 15 of Acts, verses 15 and following. He said, the words of the prophets agree. And he begins to quote out of Amos 9. And then he begins to show the scriptures are bearing witness to this. And again, the unseen, miraculous working of the person of God, the Holy Spirit, underneath the story, bringing the word of God alive to the people of God. And suddenly the, the, the Holy Spirit brings them. This is miraculous. It always is. Because if you've been around us, Lord have mercy, we can never agree about anything. (laughs) But when the Spirit of God begins to move in our midst, what happens? He unites us to one mind. And there you see the same thing. The fellowship gathered, the word of God opened and proclaimed, the grist of talking these things through, and underneath the prayers of the people, the movement of the Holy Spirit. And then you hear the statement, it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. And out of the the, the moment that came out of conflict when they all agreed of what to do with the false doctrine, they were all unified, they wrote a letter, and everybody rejoiced in worship. It's all there. Apostles' teaching, the fellowship, the breaking of bread, and the prayers. We could spend so much time here because I just simply want to say that I know that formation happens with worship. Many of our people don't know how to worship. They think that worship is found in a bulletin in singing a song. Especially our liturgies are controlled. Being in small group, in informal worship, we begin to learn adoration. We learn how to praise. We learn how to give thanks in worship. We learn to open our mouth. We learn to use our bodies in worship of mind, heart, body, and soul. We learn in worship how to listen to him. Out of that worship is what forms our private devotions. Private devotions without being in group can so easily become duty and discipline and law. But when it's put in the context of the stream of the community itself, private devotions come alive. Worship is so important. This is where we learn the intimacy of our relationship with the Lord. We're formed in the discipling growing process in worship. Many of our pastors don't know the intimacy of worship. They can't teach what they don't know. 
here where the scriptures are open. Many of our people don't know the scriptures and the beauty of the word, the majesty of the word. This is, this is, the, this is the same word that it says, let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him, for he spoke and it came to be. He commanded and it stood firm. The power of God's word by the spirit of God changes life. This is why Paul said in Thessalonians 1.5, we did not speak to you in word only, but in power, in the Holy Spirit, and with much conviction. Oh, to know the word of God alive by the Spirit of God, and to feast on it all our days. The inexhaustible supply of heavenly manna to the soul, it begins in the work of a small group meeting. And it's there where we process it, where we talk about it. The way, the way it's said in Joshua, um, when the Lord said, meditate upon the word day and night, do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night that you may be careful to do all that's written in it. It's that meditation. It's that chomping. It's that, it's, that, it's, that, it's that work that we do with each other as we listen. Because I'm going to say it, part of the fellowship and part of the doing of this is that we learn to articulate what we've heard. Because how many of you know it? When you can say it, you got it. If you don't say it, don't know it. And you really don't know it because you can't say it. How many people just said, oh my gosh, that sermon last Sunday you gave, it was, oh, it was just amazing. Well, what did you take out of it? <laughs> I was really moved by it though. <laughs> See, this is the point. This is, this is where the Lord takes the word of God, begins to graft it into the soul. And finally, in the last one, it's prayer. We learn to pray together. We learn to pray for each other. We learn to, to ask for prayer. We learn, we learn the beauty and the wonder of intercession and supplication and petitions. We learn the wonder of it in the group setting. And we're formed by it. This is called the apostolic pattern. Apostle teaching and fellowship. Breaking bread and prayer. This is, this is what we do when we gather in group. That's it. That's it. This is really simple. And sometimes I just think it's the thunder of the evil one keeping us from the miracle of what happens in group when we ask Jesus, our Lord, to come be with us in group together. I'm going to do one last one. It has everything to do with trauma care. Because every story, as you can see, has got this sense of we need to be able to find the Lord and have him feed us. And so I take you one last time for this morning. I take you to that moment when we see in Aaron's leadership, Aaron the high priest, Aaron Moses' brother's leadership, that when Moses was gone, he acquiesced to the people who acquiesced to the gods of the culture. And in order to be the politician, he did what the leaders of his church wanted him to do, to keep the peace. He made the gods of the culture and put them in front of the altar in the center of the camp. Having no idea that when we compromise the culture, we're inviting the kingdom of darkness to come take our people. So that we end up holding the form of godliness and deny its power. And therefore condemn our people. But we keep everybody happy. And oh, were they happy in Exodus 32 with the golden calf. They had all kinds of worship that you couldn't actually tell the difference between the worship of the world and the worship of the church. It was just bedlam. They broke loose, filled with lusts. And what it took is Moses' kind of leadership who dealt with the, that story, but what he did for himself was so important. He took his eyes off the problem and put them on the Lord. He sought the Lord. That's where it starts. That's where everything begins. He sought the Lord. The second thing he did is he broke from camp. The profane happened in the center of the camp of that golden calf. In the center of the camp had become unclean. And so he broke. 
He went outside the camp. He took the tent of meeting and went outside the camp. You'll find this in Exodus 33, verses 7 to 11. He broke and went outside. He went outside to meet the Lord. The tent of meeting is such a beautiful phrase. The tent of meeting. I'm going out to meet with the Lord. And what happened? Those who sought the Lord went out with him. And that's what I want most of all for you. I want you to find the people in your churches who have a hunger for Jesus. I want you to disciple them. This is what he did. Out they went. Those who sought the Lord went outside the camp with Moses. And he set the tent of meeting. And the people stood there in the community around each other's tent, around their homes, all in the fellowship, obviously talking about what had happened. And now, though, praying, Lord, praying, Lord, come be with us. Because the Lord said after the golden calf, I will no longer go with you. And so they went to seek the Lord. Lord, don't leave us. The prayers of the people, don't leave us. The seeking of the Lord. And then the wonder happens. The Spirit of God descends upon the tent of meeting. And the Lord speaks to Moses as a man speaks to his friend. And of course, Moses would speak the word to the people. And all they did was worship. Because the Lord had heard their prayers. I will be with you. My presence will not leave you. This is part of what we do in trauma care. We need to break from the sin. To break from the trauma. To break from what's ever happened. It is a turning. Many of us know the word repentance as to think again, the changing of the mind, and the changing of direction. It's granted to us to break away. And they went out to seek the Lord. That's it. They went out to seek the Lord. And the promises of the Lord is we gather together in his name. He meets with us. Does he not? This is why we need him so badly, the movement of the Spirit of God upon the people of God. And then we begin to open the word. The Lord begins to speak to his people. And as the Lord begins to speak, we begin to worship him. And we find change happening inside of us. Change that's real. Change that makes the difference in our lives. And so this is why I have made my appeal. My life has been changed by it. People's lives have been changed by it. We need to actually come together and meet together in group together. The apostles' teaching, the fellowship, the breaking of bread, and the prayers. This is where we begin to receive the administration of the Lord to us. This is where we begin to find ourselves growing in the things that belong to the Lord. And this is where it's going to require change inside of us. And I get it. I know that change is hard. I've always known change is hard. 24 years ago, we um, went on a plane to Singapore to have the first consecrations. This, this, this movement began 24 years ago in January when we had the first consecrations of bishops to come back to America in our denominational setting because our church had left the foundations of the Lordship of Jesus. They began to preach a gospel that was contrary, and we could not stay. And the blessing of Rwanda, the blessing of Southeast Asia, they came and stood with us in the midst of these things. But what it required of us was change. This would mean we could lose our properties. This would mean we could lose all kinds of things. Our churches would separate because people would say, we can't, we can't go with you. It required all kinds, but this is what happens in trauma. So often we've got to make decisions that actually break us from what we've known and it's very uncomfortable and I get it. I know it, I understand it. Every part of scripture is like this. When the Lord said to Abraham, I want you to leave your country and go to a new place, that's called change. How do you do this? How do you risk, how do you do what's uncomfortable? And I get it, I know it, but I'm telling you this, that if we want to see our churches change, when it comes to the context of what our Lord has commanded us to go make disciples, 
It's got to change with us. Us. I know that was my argument yesterday. It's got to begin with us. We can't make disciples unless we are disciples. My point to you today is, in order to be a disciple, we need to get in the environment in which that happens, the context of it. We need a place where we're with brothers and sisters who are causing us and helping us to grow in Christ together. Do you see this? We need to be in group and we need to lead groups to disciple because that's the apostolic pattern. I'm sorry, it'll disrupt your schedule. But this is how the Lord works. When we meet together in group, invite him to be with us. Invite him to open the scriptures to us. Invite him to be with us as we share the grist of what we're hearing, as we learn to pray together. This is how we grow in Jesus. This is the environment of what he's designed. And I can only say this, if we wanna see change, it's time to go back to what works. What will it take for you to get into group and to lead group? What's it going to change? What's it going to take to change your life? Change schedule, change ritual, change the way we do church. As for me, I think it's time. I do not want to see our people immature in Jesus and acting and behaving like the world. I don't want to see Christians who do all kinds of good things, but inside their character is not shaped and formed. And so I make my appeal to you. Let's go back to the apostolic pattern. What do you think? How do you process that? Does it bother you? Do you know it to be true? What holds you back from it? I make my appeal to you on these questions to ask you right now to turn to each other like we did yesterday. And I want you to talk about it. I want you to get into group. (laughs) And argue why this is not true.
I'm going to gather us back together. We're having such great conversation in group, Bishop Thad. I'm going to bring us back together. Um, and I just want to mention a few things. Uh, Bishop Thad wanted me to draw our attention to the beautiful artwork that's behind us at each plenary, behind him at each plenary. This comes from a church planter named Patrick out of Raleigh, North Carolina. North Carolina, yep. Um, just beautiful. So we're thankful for Patrick for that. Um, and also, you all received this packet as you came in. This Bishop Thad created um, as an offering to us. A lot of the content is here. Um, it's such a great resource. There are more of these that if you wanted to purchase some to bring back to your communities, you can do that. But this is a, a gift for all of us who've registered. So I'm going to pray for us, and then we're going to go into a break, and then we're going to come back at 1030 for our synod meeting. Lord, thank you. Thank you that you are with us and that you've called us to be with you and to be with one another and that you do transform us as we gather together in your presence. Lord, thank you for the work that you've just begun in these groups. And I pray that um, what you've spoken to us or convicted us in, the invitation that you've given us, Lord, um, would you just continue to, to grow that and lead us and change us and then send us back to our communities. So, Lord, we love you, and we, we thank you, Lord. Amen. So you're going to go into a break now for 15 minutes, and then we'll be back at 1030. <laughs>